And welcome to ETF Edge, your go-to place for everything exchange-traded funds. I'm your host, Bob Pisani, coming to you from the Future Proof Conference in Huntington Beach, California. Over 2,500 investors and financial advisors have gathered to hear advice from a galaxy of investing stars and do a little socializing on the beach. And we are on the beach. It's an attempt at reviving the financial conference for a younger generation. Many ETF providers are also here. We have three of the best with us, Jan Van Eck, CEO of Van Eck, who runs a suite of ETF products, Michael Sonnenschein, CEO of Grayscale, and runs the Grayscale Bitcoin Trust, which is seeking to convert to a Bitcoin ETF, and Alex Morris, the CIO of FM Investments, which was a pioneer in single treasury bond ETFs that have taken off in the last year. Uh, Jan, I'm, we're sitting here on the beach here. Uh, yeah. I haven't been to a lot of uh, uh, conferences that are literally on the beach. Uh, they seem to be trying to combine social interaction, parties, with serious financial investing. What do you make of all this? I think it's, um, listen, attention spans. I look at a macro picture, attention spans are really short these days. So they have content, but it's going to be short clips. Yeah. And that makes a lot of sense. No one wants to sit through a half hour lecture on, you yeah. know, the yield curve. We tend to, Michael, <laughs> knock ourselves out with trying to get the best content anywhere. But what we find out of places like this is people come for the social interaction as much. They're going to have Method Man here. Uh, you know, on Tuesday night, this is Wu Tang Clan. Uh, <laughs> one of the one of the members of Wu Tang Clan are going to be here. So, what's the, the lesson here? I think whenever you can get this type of community engaged in a different type of environment, allow people to make meaningful connections, it's something you want to be a part of. Yeah, it seems like you can get. There's a lot, Alex, of people who are having here sort of private meetings with financial advisors and, and, and a chance for, to meet clients directly at this point. That seems to be the big thing. Just the, the interaction of being able people to Yeah, folks meet are happy. They're, they're on the beach walking around. I mean, yeah. I'm still giving my 30-minute lecture on the yield curve, so I don't <laughs> think Jan will be stopping by anytime soon. But uh, in general, folks are happy, and it's great. I mean, we don't need to sit in a stuffy ballroom to talk about good ideas. Yeah. They're good ideas wherever they are. Yeah, you, there's plenty of chances to nerd out here. I don't want to give a sense that it's a giant party, but social interaction is as big as uh, any conference I've been to. So, Jan, uh, let me start with you. It's a big week for you. You run the largest semiconductor ETF, VanX Semiconductor. SMH is the symbol. Market cap weighted index, 25 largest semiconductor companies. Uh, this week, ARM is going to be going public, likely Thursday at the NASDAQ. Um, and the question is, uh, sort of explain to us how this process works. So when, when will you be potentially a buyer of this uh, and what, what criteria is being used? Yeah, it's an interesting story because it's a $50 billion estimated market cap company that you think would go into especially a specialized index like semiconductors, Bob. And in the reality is it might not. Uh, for us and our index inclusion rules, an underlying stock has to be liquid. And it looks right now that arms uh, float, public float, meaning the number of shares, the percent of shares traded on an exchange might be less than 10%. That's not liquid enough for our rules. Um, and then some of, you know, uh, SLK and some, sorry, um, SLK, the other sort of uh, sector spider ETFs, it has to be part of the S&P. I mean, that could take years, could take a while. right? This 10% rule was, is a little disconcerting because you, you'd be a natural buyer here. And if it prevents you from doing that, I think it's going to 9.5% is what it is right now. The, the float that they're talking about, yeah. you'd think that they would know that. That would be kind they, of important. They should figure this out because yeah. they want... Maybe Salt Bank should get the memo on this, sir? They want passive buyers, right? That's definitely part of any yeah. investment banker's job these days. Yeah. How do you feel about the IPO market these days? I mean, this is a big tech IPO. Uh, we've been waiting for two years for something to happen. We want, we want IPOs. We want m and I don't know if the m and is going to come in this administration or not, but that's a hell, we want that for the capital market. It's amazing how big these semiconductor companies are. I mean, NVIDIA is over a trillion dollars. I mean, I think uh, we're talking about ARM at 50 billion or so. That would put it on a level with Marvel technology. Marvel was about 2% of the value of yeah. uh, your index. And one way to, to jo jump into the index right away would be into, to be in the top 10. You have to be $90 billion market cap semiconductor company to be in the top 10. Yeah. That's a lot. Yeah. So we're, we're desperate for a hit at, at this point, right? Uh, this would be the biggest IPO since Rivian in 2021. Uh, midpoint evaluation of $50 billion. So, you know, that's below what SoftBank was looking for. But they need, the IPO community needs some kind of hit here, Yeah. I think. So I don't know how likely that is going to happen. They're pricing it below what they were talking about last time. Uh, and look what's happened to Instacart. That's pricing below the range, too. Or look, yeah. looking like it's pricing below valuations recently. 
It's the one to go. Yeah, it's a tough situation right now here. Let's turn uh, around and talk about another topic. Michael, uh, it's been almost two weeks since you won your lawsuit against uh, the SEC seeking to have your Bitcoin trust convert to an ETF. The SEC has 45 days to consider an appeal. Explain to us where are we in this process? Yes. Yeah, so the decision we got about two weeks ago is the culmination of years of work and about 14 months of litigation. Uh, the D.C. Circuit ruled three to zero unanimously in favor of Grayscale, vacating the SEC's denial order, which prevented GBTC from converting to an ETF. We're now in this 45 day period where we have to follow the federal rules of appellate procedure uh, that gives the SEC the opportunity, if they wish, to request a rehearing on the case. Um, the market reaction, the investor reaction has been very, very positive. Uh, there's not only a lot of enthusiasm in the underlying Bitcoin market, um, but certainly seen a tremendous tick up in volumes in GBTC and interest, um, have seen the discount to net asset value continue to shrink uh, since the decision came out. Um, but all of us, Grayscale, our investors, the team as a whole, the community, uh, waiting for this 45 day period. Yeah, so the problem here for the SEC, it seems to me, that the court squarely rejected, folks, if you didn't hear this, the, the, it rejected the very basis on which the SEC has been denying a spot Bitcoin ETF for the past several years. The court said, in essence, hey, you guys approved a futures-based Bitcoin product. The futures in the spot market are like products. So if you prove one, you have to approve the other. That's the rationale of the court. So I guess the question is, could the SEC come up with some new rationale why the application should not be approved and, and dare you to sue them again, come up with some other reasons. So it's certainly a possibility, Bob. Um, we recently, though, submitted a letter to the SEC since the decision came out. And one of the things we said is you've actually denied spot Bitcoin ETF applications like GBTC to the magnitude of 14 or even 15 times. So we would believe that if there was some other reason that the SEC didn't want these products from coming to market or had some other issue, it certainly would have surfaced by now in one of those other denial orders. Yeah. Um, so there's nine applications for a spot Bitcoin ETF, including yours. Um, assuming one or more are actually approved, are they all going to be approved at once? I know you've called for that to happen, right? I think the SEC um, has a real opportunity to ensure that they're not picking winners and losers yeah. in this market. Um, we have long been prepared for a world in which there are multiple spot Bitcoin products, there are multiple Bitcoin futures products on the market. Um, so it'll be interesting to see how the SEC handles those applications and yeah. the variability between them. Jan, you've got an application in for a spot. Well, the next Bitcoin news ETF. item in my mind is the ETH futures, Ethereum futures ETFs. So those have filed. We have a filing out there. And there are a number of applicants that won, and, ETH, and ours is supposed to go effective in October. Kathy so Woods, is, her uh, ARC has filed for an Ether ETF yeah, in addition. Yeah, well, that's Ether Spot. So we yeah. filed, we've been first to file as an ETF issuer, not Grayscale, but uh, established ETF issuer for a lot of products, including Spot uh, Ethereum. That was in 2021. But, you know, look, the SEC is making up a different rule book when it comes to crypto. My only point is the precedent for allowing people to go at the same time will be set here with the ETH futures. At least that's what they're saying. Sure. That so, so how do you see is. this playing out? I mean, what's your, your thoughts? Are they going to appeal? What It'll are they going to do? It'll be interesting to watch in October if everyone goes effective on the same day. I mean, that's a difficult thing for the, a regulator to manage. So I, let's see how that goes. Yeah. Alex, I want to move to you here. FM uh, had very big success last year with single treasury bond ETFs. These held on the run treasuries for just about the entire yield curve. You've got it right now, now yeah. right? So explain how these single treasury ETFs work uh, and, and a little bit of what are the advantages of, of buying treasuries using ETFs directly? Sure. You can so, always, of course, everybody knows you can you, you can go, go to the government directly and buy. But here you have a product that is essentially the same thing. But there may be some advantages to using this product. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we're innovating in the treasury market. So innovation of a different manner. You certainly can go to treasurydirect.gov and try to buy a treasury. And we encourage folks to try it. It's hard. And if you go and search for, say, the 90-day or the two-year, you're going to see hundreds or thousands of issues because the government's constantly issuing new debt that will expire in 30, 20, all the way down you know, to one year and then start counting by number of days. It's a lot of work. If you're also buying, say, 90-day paper, you're going to have to make four trades a year, if not more. There's a lot of work to that. Plus, it turns out when you focus on doing trading in that market, which is a very developed, mature market, it's hard. If you do it well, you can get better execution, better pricing, and you can also deliver tax advantages as well as accelerate income. If you buy a T-bill, you have to wait up to a year to see any income. 
in the ETFs, T-bill, X-bill, and O-bill, you get monthly income. And the same is true across the entire yield curve. So they're, they're easy to buy, first off. If you go to, you know, people say, just go on the website, you know, Treasury, Gov, Direct, you know. But if you actually ever go on that website and try to buy bonds, it's ridiculously. I, I'm a financial professional for 30 years as a reporter. I have a hard time buying on that website and understanding what it is you're buying because there's so many different products. It's very, very confusing. Forget about advising your mother to go and do it. You'll exactly. never figure it out. But here you can actually get it. So it's easy to buy. It rolls into the new contract every month. Every the month? roll costs are extremely low. Like unlike commodities, like these things roll off fine without having any serious decay associated with it. Very little decay. On the short of the curve, it's effectively zero. You're almost better off rolling just given the way the dynamics of the roll work. And now even on the long end of the curve, because coupon rates are above 3%, you're actually incentivized to roll because yeah. you're generating enough coupon that extending your duration is the right move. And the cost is what, 15 basis 15 points? 15 basis points. Yeah, one five basis points. That's relatively cheap. So how is the product being met? I mean, I had you on when you first announced it last year. Um, it, it seems to me like there's been an enormous amount of interest in sh at least short-term Treasury products. Yeah, I think we first started talking last year Everyone was rightly skeptical. Would this thing work? We had three products then, T-Bill, U2, and U10. We're now up to 10 products, so the entire yield curve, and just short of $3 billion in about 13 months. It's been very well adopted. And we're seeing use cases from institutions, from advisors, from retail investors, just really mass adoption, and it's starting to speed up and get faster. Now, you're also trying active management. You just recently launched a new ETF, Opportunistic Income ETF. The symbol is XFI. V. This seeks to maximize total return, you're saying, including income and appreciation. You're trying to identify undervalued and opportunistic sectors in fixed income markets. So this is a broad, actively managed bond fund, essentially, right? It is. Uh, so it's XFIX, XFIX for fixed income. Um, and, you know, we'd probably be laughed off the set for saying we're long bonds, but we're long bonds. And we think it's a great opportunity in the credit market, but to think a little differently. So we approach the fund thinking like a value investor, but as opposed to buying equity, we start looking at bonds, particularly those we think are likely to be upgraded, and those that are maybe not traditional bonds in their sense, so preferreds yeah. and a handful of other things that are fixed income instruments that tend to get overlooked. Yeah, it's a very interesting concept because initially your thought is, why bother doing this in an ETF wrapper? But the ease of it and the role makes it so simple. I mean, one of the problems of owning a one year is you're gonna get your money back if you go actually go buy one. Here, unless you're concerned that somehow the yield is changing dramatically in the next year and you have to pay attention, the role's automatic for you. Exactly. That's what the appeal is to me. And on the active side of the house, as we look at credit and other structures, buying bonds isn't that much easier than buying treasuries from the government. It's yeah. a hard place to be, and it's a place you need to be more concentrated than the index to actually outperform, and we think there's opportunities to do that. Yeah. Uh, Jan, you hold a whole suite of big products, but you were a commodity maven long before you were an yeah. ETF maven. Uh, run gold ETFs too on top of this. Uh, what, what are your thoughts on gold right now? Uh, well, you know I love bonds too. Remember we yeah. had this conversation yeah. a year ago. Um, I think it depends on how long the Fed you know, keeps rates higher. Um, I think there's a lot of consequences yet to roll out with these high rates. Uh, right now every, everything seems fine, but, um, but at the end of that cycle then I think crypto, Bitcoin, and gold will do well when, when that rate, but that could be a while when, until rates start falling but like i always say you never you can't really time the markets yeah. so if you're going to buy it buy some now especially yeah. with the happening coming up bitcoin volatility is at all-time lows there's a lot of leverage out of the system so and maybe yeah. an etf does get approved have you been that surprised be about general. how low the, the volatility has been around bitcoin especially since you won the the court case, the BlackRock got in, everybody got all excited, but it didn't move too much. It hasn't moved that much because there's still some uncertainty that investors are needing to price in. I think, you know, coming out of this most recent crypto winter, it's never been clearer to us that the investment community shares the same idea that we do. Crypto's here to stay. And it's been one of the best returning asset classes of the year, right? And so you do see these longer term investors continuing to build their positions in crypto. Um, and you do have some upcoming catalysts, ETFs, the happening to Jan's point. These are things that people are focused on. All right, folks, we're going to have to leave it there. Three of the best. I told you we were going to have them. That does it for this week's ETF Edge in glorious Huntington Beach, California. And I mean, we're on the beach, the beach folks. My thanks to Jan, Michael, and Alice. We'd ask Jan to stick around and give us his insight into what's next for the ETF business on the ETF Edge podcast. That's coming up next. And remember, you can see all of our shows on our website, etfedge.cnbc.com. Everybody have a healthy, happy, and safe trading week.
Get the ABCs of ETFs with the ETF Edge newsletter. Your weekly update on the hottest trends, expert analysis, actionable ideas, and exclusive insight from host Bob Pisani. Sign up now at cnbc.com forward slash ETF Edge newsletter.